All right, welcome. Uh, getting to the late period of modernism, we um, we went through a series of important projects in the last lecture, covered, I would say, probably three-fourths of the arc of the movement of modernism, starting with the international style, uh, covering the case study house movement by John and Tenza. Uh, we looked at Philip Johnson's glass house. We looked at the Farnsworth house by Mies. Certainly looked at the early work with Barcelona Pavilion. Started to look at... Um, uh, actually even advanced to some of Kahn's work um, and Ronchamp with Korb in 54. I want to take just a quick step backwards um, to cover really the last, um, really in, in this lecture, I'm going to cover four important modern architecture projects that together with the prior lecture, comprise the full arc of modernism, but fit towards the back end of the first lecture. Uh, again, with the exception of the last four or five projects in the prior lecture, uh, really, the, these, these projects are going to insert right before Ronchamp 1954. Uh, so everything that came afterwards... Um, is happening after the buildings that we're looking at now. The reason I decided to separate them is because there is a clear differentiation of scale in these works, especially starting with uh, with this one, which is the Lever House. Um, this is in Manhattan, New York. Uh, and this is uh, an architecture firm. This is 1952. Um, this is an architecture firm called Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Uh, the architect who designed this project at Skidmore Owings Merrill is uh, Gordon Bunshaft. And this building is famous uh, and is a uh, landmark, I believe, in, uh, in New York. I believe has historic status because this building is really where the curtain wall was invented. Um, I think I may have touched on this when we talked about Seagram, uh, Mies Seagram building, but the notion, you know, starting with Korb and the idea of the free plan of pulling the column away from the facade, pulling it inboard and effectively liberating the facade so that the facade does not have the role of holding the structure up any longer uh, because that's happening inboard, whether slightly or um, excessively inboard. Uh, the point is it's not happening at the plane of the skin, of the outer skin of the building which allows uh, lots of diff different things to happen. We saw what Corb did in Ronchamp. We've seen what uh, Mies did at Seagram. Uh, what Bunshaft is doing here is he's basically pulling, I mean, almost literally the glass is acting as a curtain. So the floor, um, the floor plates occur at these spandrels in between the transparent panels of glass the framing is completely outboard of the floor system and the building structural system, obviously. Um, so that's all happening on the outboard. Um, and the glasses spanning in between. Um, the similarity um, to uh, Mies here, um, or really we could say the similarity um, at Seagram to Lever House um, is that there is a dedicated urban space. The distinction or the difference is clearly Mises giving the city folk that um, urban space adjacent to the building. So in terms of Part T, it's a tall tower set back slightly from an open pub, uh, an open space. We shouldn't necessarily call it a public space because really in this case, in Bunchaft's case, um, it is a um, it. it it's not publicly accessible necessarily. Um, but the party is the same. You have a tall, slender tower mass that's set back with an o with a green space set in front of it. Difference is the whole thing is on a stylo bait here at Lever House, whereas Mies is really putting it on the, uh, the the almost literally the ground plane. It's you know three or four risers up from the 
uh, city of Manhattan sidewalk. Um, so similar part T, uh, slightly different expression, uh, 24 story building, uh, and very distinctly, um, modernism. And then even it can be more specifically categorized as international style modernism. Um, the lever company is a soap company. Um, and, uh, and again, the curtain wall is, is really the clear thing. And then also clarity of form, simplicity, um, in, you know, clearly in comparison to some of the prior styles that we've studied, the Beaux-Arts, the, um, uh, neoclassical work, the, um, uh, the Baroque, uh, and even in comparison to, classical or humanist uh architecture this is radically radically simplified and that's again one of the character defining features of the uh, of modernism and the international style um, there's a view um more perpendicular in comparison to the oblique first view that we were looking at you can clearly see the express columns and the um uh, the fact that they're pulled back from the glass facade plane allows really the curtain to um, come to the foreground and really be the most prominent thing uh, in the facade. There's a, a construction photo uh, and you can actually see the curtain system is actually even outboard uh, of the floor plate. So sometimes the, the glass will actually span from floor to floor. Other times it'll actually be picked up by the edge of the floor deck and almost literally be hanging off of the edge of the uh, floor. So there's a view of the lobby uh, and there's a view up looking just past that uh, the edge of the uh, third floor uh, open space that's adjacent to the tower. Uh, and there's a, a elevation view uh, from Skidmore, Wings, and Merrill. Okay, the second uh, project uh, is this project, which is from Le Corbusier, who we know well at this point. Uh, this is also 1952. 1952 is just an amazing year for architecture. Um, uh, this is uh, Unité des Habitations. This is in Marseille, France. Um, and this is really Corb's... Um, for Ronchamp is a larger project than the typical villa residential work that Corb was doing for the 15 or 20 years up until this point. Um, so you, one can make an argument that Ronchamp is, um, is him breaking a little bit out of his comfort zone in terms of working in, with that kind of residential module of the villa. But I think the strongest argument is Unité is a complete inward looking of for Corbusier and, and, and basically a discovery of something that really he's never taken on before, which is the huge scale problem. So Unité, uh, we call it the block, the residential block. Unité actually has 1,600 uh, living units, um, and it was – the commission basically came about as, as a result of the – um, the bombing of World War II and the French government basically wanted to build a housing building to give the 1,600 or so, well, more than 1,600, 1,600 units, so probably closer to two or 3,000 inhabitants who had become displaced by the bombings of World War II. Uh, the government was investing in a project to basically give them living spaces uh, back. Uh, and so Corb Designs, this thing, which is an architectural project, it's also an urban design project because he, and in his own words, he basically des designs a vertical garden city. The idea, Corb's main idea with uh, Unité is that everything happens in this building for the residents. You can shop in this building. There are, sh there are uh, markets, shops, gift shops, etc. cetera, um, places for laundry, places to purchase clothing. So you can do your daily shopping in this building. Obviously, you can live in this building. You can play in this building. We're going to look at um, some of the, uh, the the rooftop spaces here. And even in the intermediate floors, there are these kind of wide, open, arid, um, really corridors, but corridors that are, um, that are open and not enclosed on both sides and are raised up above the ground plane, which is makes a great place for kids to kind of run around and play and 
um, be somewhat safe in that they're not necessarily out on the public sidewalk um, and they're in a somewhat controlled environment. Um, so shop, live, play, and just interact and create opportunities for chance interaction between people. Core was a big, uh, big fan of basically just facilitating kind of interaction uh, with his work. Um, so you get a sense of the scale of it, the the playfulness in this kind of otherwise very orderly, rigid grid system. What he's playing with is the louvers and the panels. He's kind of repeating on a uh, on a non regular um, um, uh, kind of process to give the facade uh, dynamism. It's really three, four kit of parts at the most. It's the uh, opaque at the ground plane, uh, all glass with only the fin at the top plane, uh, glass with a solid piece at the head directly below the um uh the opaque uh balcony rail and then there's the vertical louver so he's basically playing with that kit of parts all of which fit within this single module and by um sporadically and more randomly positioning those things he gives the the building a more uh dynamic uh quality there's a sense one of the interior corridors uh, corb loves you know, to use light as you've seen in, in some of his work. Um, so these kind of accents are also serve as a way to differentiate, uh, units, you know, you're, you're the red unit, I'm the green unit, etc. Um, and then that even carries to the outside in the light, um, paint color that's applied on the, uh, on the fins to the inside, which I think further gives the qual the building a, um, kind of a, a more human and a dynamic quality in addition to how he's playing with the facade as we talked about. There's actually a really good view um, to show, to articulate that quality. And, you know, um, these are certainly not Pilot T, but he's playing off of that same idea of basically lifting the building up off of the ground plane uh, and really having, um, allowing the city to kind of breathe and flow underneath the building and through the building. And the building is kind of lifted up on uh, what would be uh, heavier opaque columns, but nonetheless still elevating the building up above the ground plane. So the building sits with Corb, with Villa and with Unite, the building sits over the ground plane, not on the ground plane. Um, and you know, if we, if he didn't drive the point home clearly enough with Villa Savoie, as we've studied, as many of you have wrote about, and by the way, I finished grading the, uh, exam number five yesterday on modernism, fantastic work. Um, many of you wrote about Villa Savoie and the five points. Um, so if the point wasn't articulated clearly enough there, he's giving us the, roof garden, the roof that is an active space that can serve as a place for yet more uh, interactions and um, recreation of its inhabitants. Uh, Beton Brut, concrete, um, that's another character defining feature of Unite. Um, okay, that's Unite. Shifting back to another Khan building, and really this is the first major commission that Khan uh, receives and this becomes the kind of platform or the spring point for him to launch his career. We looked at Kimball Art Gallery. Uh, I think we looked at uh, Phillips, uh, the, the Phillips Exeter Gallery or the library. Um, and we're looking here. So at the at pro project that occurred before both of those. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We looked at uh, the Salk Institute. But a project that occurred before really all three of those is the Yale Art Gallery, and this is in 1953. Khan is teaching at Yale uh, in the architecture department. Um, George Howe is teaching at Yale. Philip Johnson is teaching. Lou Khan is there. Joseph Albers from the Bauhaus, if you remember, uh, is teaching at Yale. So Yale is kind of the epicenter of modernism and the international style and kind of propagating these new ideas into the United States at this prestigious uh, university, but also prestigious architecture program. Uh, so when it comes time to design a new 
combined building. So program for the Yale Art Gallery is basically combining art gallery space with art classroom space as well as architecture classroom space. So it's combining academics with uh, gallery, you know, display of the artwork. So the program in and of itself, I think, gives Khan the first opportunity to do something interesting and creative and unique with the Yale Art Gallery in that there's a need to reconfigure space. So the spaces need to be able to function um, in one part of the day as a gallery, but be able to function the next day or earlier in the day as teaching spaces, academic space, classroom space. So what he develops is this idea of the uh, what you're looking at above is uh, is obviously concrete, uh, and you're looking at a tetrahedron uh, cast in place concrete floor roof system. This allows him to do a couple of things. This allows him, as you can see in this image, to have some pretty long span areas where it's not as interrupted by. Um, many columns, which uh, lends itself well to art gallery, but also lends itself well to kind of walls that move or that pivot, um, and also just kind of larger uh, classroom spaces where you might lay out several desks and, and studio tables um, for a group of 20 or 30 to participate in a studio uh, or break them down into smaller modules uh, based on where the columns occur. So you kind of see this idea of the open, the, the long span spaces, the tetrahedron, the concrete allows him uh, to, to do that. <clears throat> this is where I think I made the point uh, probably with Kimball um, of... Khan's idea of service and served. So the, the idea that there's hierarchy in spaces and really that hierarchy can be distilled down into two categories, the spaces that are the primary spaces of the building, and those are the served spaces. So they everything else is in support of those spaces. So there's the service spaces and there's the served spaces. So the art gallery would be the served space, um, the closet, the stairs, the storage spaces, the, um, the, the kitchen, the lounge. These would all be um, it, these would all be spaces that serve the primary spaces. So served and service spaces. So those would all be the service spaces where the galleries and the classrooms themselves would be the served spaces. Um, so I, th this photograph is um, actually one of my favorite slides in, in, in the semester. It really shows um, really the thinking of the architect. He's, you know, the challenge is obvious we have a existing Beaux-Arts building and we have this new building that needs to address the Beaux-Arts building if for no other reason than the fact that it is adjacent to. Um, whether there was something written in the program that required the building to respond to it or not, I don't know. Uh, and it doesn't matter because most architects, when we're designing projects, we are trying to um, if not be respectful of the context, at least respond to the context. And so I think what Khan is doing here um, can be interpreted a couple of ways. Somebody, maybe somebody who doesn't have as much appreciation for um, architectural theory and architectural principles and doesn't spend the time to really understand what Khan is doing here may at first glance look at this and say he's not respecting context. He seems to be juxtaposing and almost like sticking his tongue out at the Beaux-Arts building, uh, which would be a less than respectful way to treat your immediate adjacent neighbor. I would say he's doing a couple, I would say three very important things with the facade of the building that I think make it a highly respectful project of its neighbor um, to the right in this image. One, the parapet 
is deliberately lower than the existing building parapet, such as to say you were here before, you have a longer, deeper history, uh, I'm not trying to overshadow you, and so here I am being respectful uh, in, in terms of not trying to even compete with your height, let alone be taller than you. I'm going to hold the parapet down, um, you know, five or six feet um, it, with respect to the height of the adjacent building. So that's one. Two, you can clearly, clearly see the banding that he's using by um, elevating the steps such that the ground plane is lifted up off of the city grid, maybe four or five feet. That line, that first horizontal line, that um, I, th I don't think this is exactly the floor level. I believe the floor level is a little bit lower, but he's articulating the facade with this horizontal banding that repeats, certainly, but he's starting it at the same horizontal plane, almost as if to say the building is actually a continuation of that existing facade. In my opinion, a highly respectful move that Khan, uh, or a highly respectful gesture that he's making to the existing building. And third and finally, he is, um, there's really a fourth, which is the, the use of masonry, which actually is quite similar to the existing masonry. But third is he is terminating the masonry of his facade, and he's actually putting this kind of slender, thin glazing or, or window system in the facade to separate and create a clean break. And what I think this allows Khan to do, which to me is, seems like a masterful move, is it actually allows the, both the new building and the existing building to breathe a little bit and the transparency kind of modulates almost like peacefully between the two, uh, creates a little bit more of a sense of harmony by not having this tension or this competition with opaque masonry material meeting up with opaque masonry material. Just, I don't know, fascinating, uh, fascinating design uh, photograph uh, here, in my opinion, that um, really speaks to some of the some of Khan's ideals. Uh, this is the opposite facade, so you, you see a lot of the similarities of cleanliness. I mean, it's almost like I can only read two materials. You can see actually the horizontal lines carrying through as they wrap on the perpendicular plane. Uh, this is so this gives you a real good sense of the open space that he's able to achieve by doing the precast or the cast in place uh, tetrahedron. Uh, roof. Khan was uh, was interested in um, Buckminster Fuller's ideas. If you guys are at all interested in kind of interesting geometric structural principles, um, look up Buckminster Fuller. He's famous for doing the geodesic dome. Uh, in the last lecture on uh, kind of postmodernism, ending postmodernism and, and getting into some contemporary work, we're going to talk about Norman Foster. Norman Foster is another a protege or a disciple of Buckminster Fuller, but you know, Khan was also looking at Fuller's work, and the tetrahedron kind of comes from some early studies that um, Bucky Fuller was doing. Uh, brilliant, brilliant uh, treatment of actually a service space. So, this is one of the secondary spaces, it's the primary stair shaft in the building. And, uh, you know, one can make the argument that there's, again, references here to classical antiquity with the pyramid, but you're looking up at the stair shaft. Uh, he brings in light. So he uses this very cold concrete material, not unlike what he does at Kimball, but he gives, he softens the quality of the beton brute of the sort of cold, heavy, um, brutal looking concrete. Uh, raw concrete by flooding the space with natural light, which seems to basically give it a completely opposite quality than it would be if it were these materials with no natural light. Similar to how Kimball would be if there was no wood accents on the laboratory balcony spaces. Just that sort of touch of, of um, contrast with a natural uh, material. In this case, the material I would argue is light. 
at Kimball, the material is wood. <clears throat> There's actually a section through the tetrahedron. So this is all concrete. Uh, this is reinforcing going through it. It's allowing the system to kind of triangulate, hold itself together. Uh, the, the gapping, uh, the, the diagonal is creating basically space, which is offsetting the distance between tension and compression, which allows uh, for longer spans. And then you're looking at basically the floor above. You can see he has it called out. In some places, there's TNG wood floor, so tongue and groove wood floor. In other places, there's marble. Uh, and then you can certainly hang uh, lots of things either from the upper underside of the concrete floor deck or even from the uh, diagonal fins, the tetrahedron fins. Um, some similarity, if you think back to the, uh, to the Whitney Museum, Marcel Breuer, uh, but this idea of kind of pulling, uh, you know, the semi-outdoor space out and then bringing light into, uh, into the building. And then, you know, the section is basically showing you the one, two, three, four, five levels where that tetrahedron, uh, floor system is used. Um, Pivoting now to uh, another building only a year later, uh, actually a year prior, I should say, from the Yale Art Gallery in 1953, um, is another 1952 project. And this is, again, Le Corbusier. Uh, really, it's Le Corbusier and Oscar Niemeyer. I'll uh, kind of briefly explain the story of this project. But this is the United Nations building. It's the what you're looking at in the foreground. The tall, slender, international style modernist tower is is called the Secretariat Building, uh, and it's all the offices for the United Nations. Um, and then uh, in the background, the lower, uh, kind of more monolithic, concrete, um, also modernist building. I wouldn't call that international style. Uh, that lower uh, building is called the General Assembly Building. You're going to see a slide here in a moment, which is probably going to be familiar to you if you've ever seen on the news or read news articles when they're talking about you know someone's presentation at the United Nations. You're most often you're seeing that photograph. If it's an indoor photograph, it's happening inside that building in the background, which is the General Assembly Building. The Secretariat Building, I suppose, I don't know, are the offices for all of the member nations of the United Nations. Real briefly, the United Nations is probably many, if not all of you know, was created in the late 40s or early 50s. It was basically a uh, kind of a peacekeeping uh, agreement among nations in the post-World War II um, environment where there was a lot of tension and arms race and buildup um, of military might. Um, the United Nations was an effort to, after the catastrophic events of World War II, to basically try and be more proactive about diffusing those tensions and bringing all nations who decide to be uh, member nations of the United Nations, which I think started as the League of Nations, um, to sort of diplomatically and through dialogue and through meeting and through arguing, but kind of, you know, in a more diplomatic, more modern way, resolve uh, some of those issues and essentially keep more peace. Okay, so Corb designs the Secretary, the General Assembly building in the background. Oscar Niemeyer designs the Secretariat Building. The United Nations obviously understands it's doing a very important thing in, like I said, the late 40s, early 50s, <clears throat> when they decide to uh, create this organization called the United Nations. So they search uh, across the world. They basically vet m multiple different site options. I believe it was John D. Rockefeller who decides to basically gift this portion of land that's um, on the east end of the island of Manhattan um, on the waterfront. He basically decides to uh, just gift the land, uh, which is waterfront property, which is kind of prime property, 
gift the land to the United Nations as a gesture and really as an encouragement for the United Nations to decide to pick New York as the site and really America as the site for the United Nations. I believe the, the actual parcel has kind of been designated as, um, uh, what's it called? Not international, sovereign. I believe the parcel is actually considered sovereign territory in that it's not technically um, uh, overseen by, it's not under the sort of protection of the United States. And it's really considered, I think, international territory. Um, but you know, the land gift obviously is helpful. They were considering other options. I think Niagara Falls, probably somewhere, multiple sites in Europe. I know the Europeans were very um, irked about the fact that um, the United Nations uh, decided to call New York its home, but it made sense from a logistics and travel standpoint as well. It's kind of centrally located. It's uh, it's already a travel uh, hub for the world. Um, and uh, it's really on the, you know, the Atlantic, which is on the left-hand side of the pond, as, as some people call it, and then really Europe, which is where the majority, well, I wouldn't say the majority, but lots of the um, member nations in the United Nations are from Europe, and so that's really on the east side of the pond, whereas New York is on the west side. So anyway, makes sense, I don't know, all kinds of politics probably to make this happen, but they decide on this site and they launch an international competition. I don't know how many entrants there were, but um, I think it was in the hundreds of kind of prominent international architects submitting at this time. Um, the jury, incidentally, selects Oscar Niemeyer, who we haven't studied Oscar Niemeyer, another uh, luminary modernist, um, Brazilian modernist. Um, he uh, his scheme is selected as the winning scheme, which I believe was actually two kind of equally, um, uh, equal volume towers that were creating kind of an open space in the middle. And so the two kind of equal masses created an opportunity for some interaction in the public and open spaces, the plaza, if you will, uh, in between them. Corb at that time in 52 is already considered, you know, um, Niemeyer is a younger, relatively speaking, architect. Um, Corbusier has already established himself as one of the most prominent architects uh, internationally. And so um, Corb, in whatever ways he uses, basically coerces or convinces Niemeyer that the equal volumes is really not the right way to solve the problem. And his competition entry, where it was basically more of a juxtaposition and almost like this tension created by a large, tall, slender tower juxtaposed against this flat monolithic. So large, slender, tall, transparent tower juxtaposed against this monolithic, low volume, uh, horizontal, um, assembly building is really the right way to solve the problem. So Niemeyer actually as a kind of homage to what he later says, you know, the master spoke and I respected the master, basically accepts Korb's way of solving the general assembly building and um, kind of sticks with his way of solving the uh, secretariat building. And I think both develop their respective building plans and that's why uh, the two are credited uh, to those two respective individuals. Um, the UN is to be obviously a symbol of uh, a bright, peaceful future ahead. Um, Niemeyer's entry is number 32. Corbs is number 23. Uh, we talked about the Secretariat building, the Assembly building. Uh, oh, on the uh, Secretariat building, the green that you're seeing, um, well, uh, I think the green that you're seeing in this image is really... Uh, reflection from the water, but the uh, opaque material on that facade uh, in limited use is actually Vermont marble, um, categorically and very clearly international style. Uh, and then the uh, General Assembly building is uh, predominantly concrete and uh, um, exposed concrete, actually, as you're seeing here on the facade. Um, so there's a view of n not the general assembly building, but one of the meeting spaces, conference spaces, um, in the general assembly building. This is the general assembly main hall with the dome and the sort of elliptical or curved 
orientation, um, almost suggesting this sort of kind of inclusivity, this sort of um, more harmonious way of uh, people sitting and being oriented, um, such as to, you know, quote, bring people together. Uh, there's actually a real good uh, color view of the uh, General Assembly. Okay, uh, that's all I have on uh, this final lecture to really close out modernism. So again, as I mentioned before, really in your mind, position these four pro very important projects that we just looked at um, at the midpoint of the prior lecture on modernism. Um, and then obviously some of the late modernist work that we saw there. Um, and that closes that topic out. And really the final lecture, which I will post here soon, is going to be really from uh, Centre Pompidou. So 1976, 1977. Let's see, where is Centre? Yeah, 1977 up until about 2005. And that will close out our semester. And then I will spend... Uh, some time doing a, an exam prep with you all uh, next week so that you'll be ready for the final exam. All right. Great work. Keep up the fantastic writing. Um, I believe you have an essay due uh, in three or four days. So um, uh, let me know if you have any questions and I look forward to uh, look forward to continue to uh, support you and read your work and see you guys developing your skills as you are. I commented to many of you that you're sort of peaking at the right time. Your writing is clearly measurably um, at its best point that I've seen so far. So uh, let's build on top of that and let's finish real strong uh, here in the next week and a half. All right. Thank you.